Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing a question that is fundamental in our tech-laden society. Do we really need to read? Our special guests today are Adiola Whitney, CEO of Reading Partners in Oakland, Lessa Pelayo Lozada, President of the American Library Association based in Chicago, and Miranda Restovic, CEO of the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities. So thank you all for joining us. This is going to be a great, great discussion, one of my favorite topics. Uh, January 2022, Gallup poll concluded that reading appears to be in decline as a favorite way for Americans to spend their free time, with only 6%. 6% of U.S. adults naming reading as their favorite way to spend an evening, which is half of uh, 2016 results. And then we've all seen some of the results that have come in on student performance after COVID and how that has tanked, uh, in part because uh, we're we're deprived of group um, activities, classrooms, and so on. So, uh, Ariola, are Americans reading less? Are you finding that we have uh, work to do? And one of one big question, you know, we can get anything by a video through our devices, right? Do we really need to read as much as we did before? Adiola, what's your answer to this? Such a great question. And Mark, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Lessa and Miranda, I am honored to be sharing this panel stage with you. Um, there's so many ways to answer that question. I think the first thing, Mark, that I would share is you know, reading for leisure, as I think we all know, has many benefits from helping folks sleep better to lowering stress and creating uh, a positive literacy environment at home. But we know that there are many other activities available for adults to spend their leisure time. And so declines in reading for pleasure for me, as a CEO of, of Reading Partners, isn't the core issue that I'm focused on. I think a greater Concern for me is ensuring everyone in this country has the resources they need to become skilled and confident readers and choosing whether or not to read in the evening is a wonderful freedom to have. And I know from the work that we do at Reading Partners, not everybody, um, not not having that choice, not having that choice in itself is is a problem. Um, At Reading Partners, our vision is that a that all children will have the literacy skills that they need to reach their full potential. And in order for that vision to be a reality, I want to see a country where three things can happen. I think those three key words are books, role models, and evidence-based literacy instruction. So for books, I want to ensure that children have access to books and importantly, books that they can see themselves reflected in. And two, that children have role models who encourage their curiosity in exploring books and supporting their literacy development. And then third, the children are offered evidence-based literacy instruction to help them gain literacy skills and are given support and attention when they are confronted with challenges in learning to read. Mark, you brought up uh, um, earlier the recent NAEP scores or National Assessment of um, Educational Progress, or what some of us know as the National Report Card. And the data showed that post-pandemic reading scores for nine-year-olds are at least, are at the lowest level in 30 years. And there's a decline just Overall, I think the biggest decline that we've seen in this country, like by 5%, I think there was just an article yesterday. We need adults to care about reading and we need all hands on deck approach to help students catch up after the pandemic, um, given that it caused disruptions in learning And, and reading partners relies on community volunteers And last year alone, we were able to engage almost 6,000 community volunteers who supported students through one-on-one tutoring. The bottom line is that reading is foundational. The ability to read transforms lives and empowers children and communities to thrive. And our future generations have incredible potential to impact the world um, in new and exciting ways when their talents and brilliance is fostered and supported through their young years. And literacy is foundational to making all of that um, a potential and a reality. And I know I didn't get to the technology question yet, but I'll maybe stop there because I want to be mindful of time and would really, I know that we want to hear from everyone else. Well, and and, and thank you so much, Ariola. I'd like to give uh, Lessa um, a a, a opportunity to to weigh in and then Miranda, because um, Lessa and Miranda's organizations have a broader uh, purview. And we've seen in the library world, for example, 
this migration from uh, books that exist in stacks, right, and primarily being uh, organizations that provide access to books, free access to books, to being organizations that are gathering points that um, have more computer terminals in them, they're, they're more rich media. Lessa, how do you see the relationship between reading and the other services that the libraries that are part of your membership uh, provide? And, and how does your membership see the importance of reading within the constellation of services that they provide? Absolutely. So plus one to everything Adiola said, and thank you so much for having me here this morning. This is a very exciting opportunity for us at the American Library Association. Are you not you know, going to do it out with Adiola? I thought that America was all about being just oppositional and, and <laughs> you know, disagreeing with each other, right? You're going to agree? That is the beautiful thing about libraries is we are here to close that divide and to bring different perspectives together and to be able to share, to create that community that you were exactly talking about, Mark. And I think that one of the things that we're really seeing in libraries is that we're, we're traditionally rooted in reading, right? Reading in the text, but what we're looking at are many different kinds of literacies so that we can bring in technology and pair them together. I think it's important to note that when one in Five or 43 million adults in the U.S. cannot read, write, or do basic math above a third grade level, we really have to kind of question where our priorities are as a society and why we don't encourage reading and literacy more for all of our members. I mean, it's been proven that literacy is key to ensuring positive life outcomes for our communities and ensuring they can participate in all aspects of our world, which absolutely ties into also, I think, the concerns around the need to see reading and literacy as social justice issues so that we can ensure that all people have equitable access to the skills and resources they need to fully participate so they can communicate and analyze and criticize and synthesize and create information no matter its origin, whether you are seeing it on a screen, whether you are hearing it verbally or whether you are reading it. And we have all of those different forms in libraries. And I would also posit that reading less right now may even also be attributed. There's a long-term and historical issues, but in the current to this divide that you're talking about right now, Mark, I think that we're seeing individuals who are seeking to limit access to information, which of course is at the heart of the American Library Association. And we're seeing that full force in censorship and book banning and all of those things. But if I there is hope, right? And I see libraries as that hope because we are doing programming that roots in all the different types of digital literacy, financial literacy, traditional literacy, that we're helping to break down those challenges and barriers. So we're working with all ages, right? It's not just early literacy because there are different stages when folks come in. Also, we're looking at new immigrants and their literacy levels and how to help them attain English proficiency in all of these different areas. So um, some of the programs that our libraries across the nation are doing are getting your high school diploma through the library, you know, getting your citizenship through the library, as well as our traditional early literacy programs like story time um, and all of those beautiful after school programs that we continue to host. I love your definition of literacy, where you bring math literacy into a financial literacy, these different types of uh literacy, arts literacy, and that really sets Miranda up uh, gorgeously because Louisiana is one of the great, great states for all these types of, of experiences, arts experiences, literary experiences. What a great tradition you have uh, there in your state, uh, Miranda. Talk a little bit about your take on um, how the endowment for, for the humanities helps people to engage in these various educational pursuits that then become foundational to careers, found, uh, become foundational uh, for family life. Absolutely, um, so wonderful to be here. And yes, I plus to everything that Adiola had said. And also, Les, I just wanna um, thank the American Library Association. We have been longtime partners um, with ALA through our primetime family reading programs. And of course, as the uh, Louisiana affiliate to the National Endowment for the Humanities here in Louisiana. And by the way, there's a humanities council in every state and territory. So there is an organization like ours that operates in all corners of our nation, advancing humanities and literacy, which is the kind of foundation of the humanities in many ways. 
Um, so just want to shout out to all of my colleagues out there who are also advancing this amazing work. But Mark, you're absolutely right. You know, we are blessed in Louisiana in many ways. We have, um, we are rich in many things that are important. Um, our people, um, our culture, um, our traditions, our values. Um, we also are poor in many ways. Um, and some of those um, traditional ways that we measure poverty also come by way of literacy. Um, Louisiana, it's no, no surprise to anybody, has typically been at the bottom of every poll that comes out um, that is measuring a traditional success of our young people in educational attainment. Um, and so it's no surprise that the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities for 50 years has been focusing on shoring up um, and breaking the cycle of illiteracy, whatever it, its causes are. Um, and, you know, the way that we have done that in our work has been through the mechanism of the family, whatever the family may look like, and we are not, um, you know, we don't prescribe a particular kind of family, it doesn't matter, um, but we really um, have believed from the start that literacy starts in the lap. Uh, it starts way before a child enters a formal school setting, and a family unit, whatever it looks like, is a great place for us to focus our efforts. This is where our partners in libraries are a great partner for us because libraries are welcoming free spaces for all families. And Louisiana is one of those states where there is a library in every parish, which is our counties. Even the most rural communities have a beautiful free library um, that acts in many ways as much more than a place to read, but a community center, a gathering space, um, a place where internet and Wi-Fi is easily accessible. Um, and so our focus has really been on that family unit and building up families as places where reading, and not just reading for the sake of reading because you need to pass the test, but reading as a favorite family pastime because reading quality literature helps you understand the world around you and helps, you, helps you understand other perspectives, right? Absolutely. It helps you, uh, helps you get to know your family members, helps you understand where you come from, helps you build an understanding of your community. And so our work in prime time, which has been our program for 30 years that we have been advancing, has been focusing on the family, but also, you know, really leveraging our partnerships with libraries and school districts, Head Start programs, child care centers, churches, Anywhere where families feel free um, and uh, safe to gather, we have been working with those communities to create environments where literacy and reading and discussion of important topics to people's lives is something that can happen. You know, the thing that doesn't escape my notice, a lot of, a lot of our work, because we deal in American civil society issues, a lot of our work is affected by one of the grand topics in U.S. history, which is race. But in reading, it's so often um, the case that I'm speaking with advocates like yourself who are not men, women, right? People of, of other orientations and other identities. But men are not as well represented in this particular field. Um, and, and you see that also with, with uh, the teaching professions, particularly in the K through 12 professions. Um, are, are, are we looking at, at this such an important challenge? It's fundamental to our success, to every single business that we have educated kids that grow up into educated youth, that grow up into empowered adults. Are we really thinking about this holistically? in a way that engages all of our talents? And, and should we be engaged in a way that is uh, that invests more time and energy and attention, including of us neglectful men, of, uh, of trying to encourage that kind of thinking that is represented here by the three of you and others of your colleagues? Or, or am I off base in terms of looking at this? Adiola, do you have any comments on, on on that on that issue? It's just I, I I do these shows all the time, and I you know in our search work, I'm I'm talking with so many people. It just doesn't escape my notice that 
women are so much more engaged and so much they express their leadership so much more powerfully. And I, I just feel like we we need to really be talking a little bit more about this because there are children, right? All of right. our children. Right. I think representation is extraordinarily important, Mark. I mean, I think one of the things that I don't I don't know um, all of the data, but I'm, I'm sure we, any of us could look it up. But I mean, the percentage of women teachers versus men, uh, but also the percentage of women who volunteer versus men right. at reading partners, the percentage of women or people who identify as women um, volunteer tutors versus men. So then, you know, what are students are seeing then are a lot of caring women, more caring women um, who want to help them read than men. And so we've made a number of different pushes just at reading partners to really focus and hone in on trying to um, diversify our tutor base, um, not just by uh, gender, because we also try to do so by race and by age, but um, I, I think you have a well. point. Uh, yeah, go ahead. What were you saying? A language group as well, because we have Absolutely. multiple languages, right? A different, yes. different uh, uh, Spanish and 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 uh, and different language groups depending on what communities we're in. Yes, and I mean, I think in, in the same way as you talk about ensuring that men um, do more than talk about it, but act on it, right? That that demonstrate the importance of reading through their actions. I think it's also critically important that young people see themselves in what they're reading. So if, if, I, if, if it's a young boy of color reading, how can we try to get a, a young man of color to read with him um, so that he can see like, yes, there are people who look like me who also care about reading. Or the poetry, I think that's, that's really important. embedded in the arts, right? Uh, and, and literacy and music. I am, I am not able to read music. I would love to be able to read music, right? I've struggled through it uh, unsuccessfully. Uh, Lessa, when you're looking at, at creating the uh, services that you create in each of your various member libraries to their communities, how are you seeing those services evolve in a way that, that uh, functions at the intersectionality of, of literacy? but also advocacy for literacy and, and, and trying to ensure that those people who are not walking into your library feel a greater sense of invitation and there are programs that connect to their daily world. Um, how, do you, how do you support your members in that respect? So we provide lots and lots, an overwhelming amount of resources, I think, on how to incorporate equity, diversity, and inclusion principles into our everyday work. Because that is, of course, one of the American Library Association's core values, and especially foci right now. And so to your point, one of the things that popped into my head when you're like, these spaces are frequently you know, occupied by women, and what does that look like? I think that it speaks partially to the feminization right, of the art profession, the feminization of reading as well as kind of this, this luxury type of thing that's happened. And one of the ways that some libraries have been trying to address this male-female dichotomy specifically is to have male-focused book clubs so that men can feel comfortable coming into these spaces and having conversations around topics that maybe they don't feel comfortable speaking about in front of women or trans folks for whatever reason. Um, and that those types of identifications of who are we missing from our libraries, right? Paying attention to who is coming to our library serving and comparing that to the demographics of our community and able to, in, to better inform the types of programs and services that we're providing is at the root of everything that we do right now in libraries. So whether it's a new immigrant community that's coming in and we need to learn all about, I was just in Tuscaloosa, Alabama and they have a growing uh, Latino population. So they had their first or second rather Hispanic Heritage Month celebration last year had about 40 people this year they partnered with all of the different community uh, groups for Latinos as well as the Latino radio station they had over 1500 people it was an amazing outdoor experience that focused on the different the breadth of the Latino community as well so those are the some of the different ways that we're looking at it right now that's it's just it's so amazing now it doesn't escape any of our notices that we're we're seeing in this these cultural warrior kind of things, this this idea of demonizing certain books or even restricting access to certain books, certain types of literature. Um, how is that feed into some of this? In other words, 
once you are able to control ideas or, or the ideas to which one has access, or if you are able to decredit, discredit uh, certain ideas, the whole idea of how dare you uh, analyze American history from a particular perspective, whether it's race or gender or anything else, how dare you? How dare you do that? It, that you, you can only analyze American history from one perspective. Um, how are you seeing this um, play out in Louisiana? Because you have this incredibly diverse state, you have different attitudes throughout uh, Louisiana. Are you finding that there is uh, this debate that is shifting how the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities functions or that you are you responding to to uh, certain um, approaches that that people are taking or are you just um, uh, taking a handoffs appro uh, approach, Miranda? We're definitely seeing in Louisiana, um, you know, um, many of our libraries and library systems and librarians uh, feel under attack right now. Um, and that's unfortunate. Um, it's unfortunate that really, really under attack. They're being they're being uh, I mean, I, I would call it to a certain extent, um, not only concern. I mean, anybody can have a discussion, but you're talking about really under attack, under stress. Yeah, uh, you know, being called out or there's uh, numerous uh, propositions in front of various councils to, um, you know, take certain books off shelves, accusing librarians of promoting behaviors that, you know, the community does not condone on a part of or a part of a community does not condone. And, um, you know, this is this is concerning, obviously, for all of us who operate in a space or under the assumption that we live in a democracy that honors the freedoms that we all uh, cherish, which is the right to read whatever we want to read um, and the right to walk into a public library that will have materials for all the people of the community. You know, I think as um, an endowment for the humanities that has been promoting family literacy for 30 years. We've also been promoting adult literacy and developing book series that um, help our communities discuss important issues like climate change and voting rights in America. And, you know, very, these are, these are topics that are pressing and important for a state like Louisiana, for our nation. We're all facing some of these same things. It's important that we continue to be a beacon and a champion that stays true to our values, which is we we promote learning. And books are one of the great ways that learning can happen still. Um, yes, uh, social media and what, what is available online is another tool that we have in our toolbox. But Louisiana is a state that is constantly producing incredible scholarship about itself. Uh, we have more books published about the state of Louisiana, our history and culture annually, I would bet, than any other state. Um, the Humanities Book of the Year category of our annual awards is the one that has consistently yielded the most nominations. Our poor book selection committee for that category has to typically read 15 books that have been nominated. And it's very specific. It's a nonfiction book, a scholarly book about Louisiana history and culture. So, you know, I think it's it's a space that we have been monitoring. It's a space where we feel like we just need to stay true to who we are as an organization, what, what we were created to do on behalf of the people of Louisiana. And as long as we can, um, you know, follow our standards and be that good housekeeping seal of approval of humanities programming, then um, we can defend the decisions that we're making about the kinds of books we're putting into circulation within our programs. Um, we have a couple of, of, um, of polls that have been just uh, completed. We asked, um, has instant availability of online media affected the amount and what you read? And 78% uh, of people said, yes, it actually has uh, affected that. And then we also talked about reading habits. And uh, we said, in comparison to previous years, have people read more or less? But I'm fine with it or less, but I'd like to read more. And the more or less, but I'd like to read more comes out to, to 25%. There's nobody who said less and I'm fine with it. So you're talking about, you're talking to readers who 
um, really enjoy that idea of reading. Um, I'd like to come back to the issue of technology and how it affects reading. Because if you look at Japan, Japan has a 99% literacy rate. And I think, Ariola, you were talking about a 20%, 20% of people are basically functionally illiterate in this country. And that basically takes a huge swath of Americans and places them in, in a, a group of people who um, are, are fundamentally disadvantaged as they, walk, as they, as they live their lives, um, uh, pursue their careers, and uh, try and shape their own economic welfare. How do we ensure that this marvelous technology that we have serves the purpose of elevating um, and not dumbing down, of, of connecting, of developing skills that are useful. It's great to watch a movie, but you can't necessarily go into work and read an instruction manual and learn how to operate a new combine or um, uh, learn how to operate uh, a new computer if you can't read. How do, you, how do we ensure that this technology is helping us and not hindering us? That's a, such a great question. And the, the statistic, the so, very sobering statistic about illiteracy in this country was one that Lessa shared. So it wasn't me and, it, and I'm, oh, I'm glad she shared it, but I just wanted to give credit where credit is due. You know, whether using technology or not, the important thing is that we have a shared understanding that learning to read proficiently at a young age or as Lessa and Miranda pointed out as adults, um, and ideally enjoying doing it is critical to the success. And I think in the case of young people, critical to their academic success and their confidence. By the end of third grade, students need to make the transition from learning to read to read to learn. And we just heard Lessa talk about the percentage of Americans in this country who cannot read, who are reading only at a third grader or level or below. Um, and how, how we leverage technology almost always has positive and negative implications. Um, this is definitely true for, techno for how technology is leveraged for reading and literacy. Um, it's important to be hyper aware I think of the limitations with technology, even technology that has been proven to be effective, particularly um, as it relates to the digital divide. Um, as technology becomes more prevalent in schooling, we should not only be asking ourselves questions like, does this work? But we should also be asking questions like, who does and doesn't have access? Um, and how do we ensure resources are equitably distributed um, if they're becoming more prevalent for learning, uh, specific to social media, while I certainly have concerns about how it can be used as a force of distraction and mental and emotional strain. I have a 20 year old and a 15 year old and an eight year old. So two of them are on social media a lot. So I think this is something I also just think about also as a parent, um, but especially for young people. I think social media platforms are a reality that we have to learn to live with and um, they can have the potential to play a productive role in literacy. In so literacy you're, you're constantly reading stuff, right? I mean, yeah. and you're reading it in short digestible uh, elements. It really, right. it really can help to boost uh, reading. Yep. One of the, one of the, um, the um, uh, respondents uh, 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 polls that we just had um, asked, uh, which format do you prefer to read in? And we got 80% of the people saying uh, printed book format lesson. So there is hope. There is hope for the for the traditional library. Um, what do you see? And, I, and then we're going to give uh, Miranda the last word. Um, what do you see as the future balance that your members are uh, providing in order to honor Adiola and, and some of the points that you you've all made? Uh, in terms of uh, bringing people to this joy of reading and the, and the skills that are required to uh, to read. I think that we're trying to meet people where they are and the ways that they want to intake their information. So I think that social media has been a great tool for us to be able to advertise the services that we have. I don't know if folks are familiar with book talk on TikTok, um, but the book reviews and sharing and the enthusiasm around print reading that you can get from social media and from those interactions, I think is essential to kind of helping to bridge that gap, but also helping to reach those who didn't know that we were available. You know, during the pandemic, digital ebook checkouts 
skyrocketed. And so many folks in our community who we thought knew what we had and that we were available said, I didn't know that this was possible now. And that those trends have not changed at all. So I think that the pairing of it is essential for us. I also wanted to correct one thing that I said in my last um, answer was when I talked about the men's book club. And I said, you know, men um, having space that they may not be able to share with uh, women and trans folks. What I meant was non-binary folks, because of course, trans men are men. So I just wanted to correct myself there. Um, but also just the excitement that I think that technology provides libraries in developing all the different types of literacies, but also in bringing folks back to the importance of the printed book and sharing that intergenerationally as reading is one of the most dangerous tasks because it's so much easier to pass a printed pamphlet or a printed book than it is to share an ebook or a social media post. I want to also recognize the fact that it takes nothing, nothing to correct oneself, right? It takes nothing to say, hey, I might have gotten it wrong, right? I mean, and, and that's really important as well. I mean, that is the thing that we learn. There are so many different perspectives. There's so many different ways of being. We can each give it, give each other a break. And, and the fact is, is that if you look at libraries, that is the greatest platform in the world for that example, because everybody comes. Everybody comes. Nobody's asked, you know, how tall they are or old they are or, you know, what uh, gender, identity, orientation, race, language. Everybody comes and, and you can actually have that experience of being with people in total enjoyment who are totally different than, than yourself. Miranda, we're going to give you the last word from Louisiana. Tell us, give us your wisdom in terms of, of informing our nation in terms of how we should think about the humanities and about literacy and about this joy of, of learning from each other. Well, I'm honored that you asked for my wisdom. I'm not sure I have too much wisdom to share, but you know, one thing that I I I firmly believe is that you know, children are they're born curious, they're born ready to do all the things that we have to that the world offers to them. Um, they're ready to engage in books, they're ready to engage in learning, they're ready to engage in technology. I think the question really is, how do we make sure that the adults in their lives do not stand in their way, do not kill the love of that learning? Um, you know, I think that that's part of why we focus on families so much at the LEH is because family is a child's lifelong learning partner. You know, I have an 18 year old. I'm still his primary partner in learning. He still calls me when he wants feedback about a paper. And if we can, as adults, just make sure we don't stand in their way, make sure we don't kill that joy, um, whether you're a librarian, a teacher, or a parent, whoever you are out there, we have a responsibility. There's nothing wrong with our children. I think there's something wrong with the rest of us. We just got to be more intentional. That's such a great point, Miranda. Let's start with yes. If we start with a yes and our, we teach our children yes, then their lives will be a yes. Miranda Restovic, CEO of Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, Adiola Whitney, CEO of Reading Partners, and Lessa Palayo Lozada, president of the American Library Association. Thank you so much for sharing the work that you do. Please thank your boards, your staffs, your volunteers all those people who come into your facilities and, and take advantage of your programs. It is just wonderful, wonderful that you've been able to share with us today. Thank you so much. Have a great day.